Good morning. This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for March 21st, 2016. We'll begin with the special order calendar decision items. Item number 140286BZ, 2212 129th Street, Queens. Okay, um, they provided a photograph showing the stray signs had been removed as we requested. <laughs> And they provided a sign drawing and the calculation sheet for signage. Um, the community board, which we didn't hadn't heard from before, had many conditions to grant, which I thought were reasonable to include in our conditions. So I would recommend doing that. I could go through those if anyone wants to, but I think we all saw that. Um, anybody else on this? Okay. Item number 222609BZ24, East 13th Street, Manhattan. <coughs> okay, uh, we um, have a letter from the neighbor, which is what we wanted to know, uh, located immediately above the PCE that, um, that, they, that the PCE has not caused, been a source of noise or vibrations. I think that's, we wanted to know that the acoustic um, measures were functioning. Okay. Continued hearing items. Item number three, 80248 BZ, 1346 Beach Channel Drive, Queens. Okay. Consistent um, with our discussions last month, the applicant submitted plans to show the proposed uh, the proposed work before proceeding to make the changes. Um, just in terms of how the drawing depicts it, I note that the infill of the garage wall should be shown as such on the floor plan of the building itself and not only on the site plan and lighting plan. Um, it, it wasn't clear to me on the plans. Um, so my question is, will the opaque aluminum fencing that's along the southeast lot line be removed and replaced by a six foot high PVC stockade fence? Um, that would then would match the fencing to the northeast, so that would run along the entire eastern lot line. I, I just couldn't understand from the drawings whether that was the case. It looked to me that they were going to have half PVC and half aluminum. And my question was, can't they make it a uniform fence along the eastern property line? I, I thought the half PVC, half aluminum was on the existing. And then the next set of drawings shows something unclear where it says PVC, and then it doesn't tell you what the bottom part is, which may be all the same, but I couldn't really tell it, from the front. For me, it was very ambiguous. I, it was a question of mine. How, how were they going to unify what seemed like two different types of fencing, and shouldn't it all just be sort of one type of fencing? So is everybody OK otherwise with what they're proposing to do? Because yes. then they can actually do the work <coughs> before we come to decision. Great. OK. Item number four, 120766BZ, 305 Washington Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, um, they requested an adjournment on this. So I, I note that, um, that the sprinkler drawings have not been filed as of yesterday, my looking on biz. Um, what I would like, though, is I, I'm not sure if the, prop, if the owners of this bookstore understand how serious it is that there's a bookstore without sprinklers underneath a multiple dwelling. Uh, that's a really serious fire safety issue. Um, I would like the fire department to inspect the site and, and if, if necessary, issue a violation so the owner will understand that this is serious and they can't keep putting off addressing it. This has been before us in hearing since April of last year. Okay. Item number five, 1250, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 1255 of 80 BZ, 3533 31st Street, Queens. Okay. Um, I just make sure I'm in the right one. Sorry. Okay, we, um, they, they drafted an easement agreement over lot 9 from lot 10, um, which in the realm of an easement agreement should include a diagram so you understand where it is. Um, but Lot 9 was not part of the original variance application. That's what we discussed the last time. And the fire corridor that's proposed to be constructed on it is accessory to a commercial, commercial use. So it's not permitted in an R5 unless you extend the variance to the adjacent lot. Um, I don't understand why the fire corridor can't be provided on site. Most restaurants 
are faced with that same kind of sole frontage issue and they need their two means of egress to go to the street. So I'm not understanding why um, they're relying on lot nine for this. Um, with respect to lot eight and nine, I'd like to know what the proposed use is as it had previously been improperly used in connection with the variance on lot 10. Um, the cover letter had some confusing discussion about the number of required parking spaces. I think it's because they're not sure how to measure um, for the requirement. So apparently there are 3,500 square feet that's kind of, I guess, front of house, but including the back of house, it's 5,200 square feet. If it were 3,500, they would have their parking waived. If it's 5,200, then they need 18 parking spaces. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what DOB does. Does it count the back of house when they're figuring out? So I think it actually would be useful for the applicant to ask DOB whether back of house could be excluded, in which case parking would be waived and we don't have to get into whether or not it needs a variance for parking. Um, then, um, because this is a... So the prior use was not a parking intensive kind of use and was also not a kind of neighborhood in position type of use. Whereas um, a restaurant is, especially, an, this, is, this restaurant has more than 200 seats. So this could be very <coughs> disruptive to the neighbors. So I think that we have to be careful about the, the change of use. Um, and so I noted that um, section 73 24 in the zoning resolution includes a number of special permits to allow eating and drinking establishments um, with entertainment and commercial districts that are adjacent to residential uses. So I think that for this proposed use, the applicant should go through the findings for the C1 overlay and respond to each <coughs> of those um, findings. Um, I'd also like to know what the proposed operation of this restaurant is that those special permits require that the owner and the restaurant operator appear. So, um, and according to what we learned last time, they have a tenant. So it means that they know what the operation should be, will be. So um, I think the tenant should come to the hearing to discuss the operation. <coughs> and that way we could find out whether, for instance, entertainment is proposed. Um, and then, uh, the, the letter actually made a comment, or statement of facts made a comment that that uh, sprinklers and fire alarms are not required in this use, but I'd like the fire department to comment on that. And also, I know that Commissioner Otley Brown will have more to say about this, but at the last hearing, we asked that the financials be revised to reflect residential development on the entire zoning lots. And <coughs> Uh, lots eight and nine have been in common ownership with this lot 10 since at least the late 1960s, um, but nothing was submitted. Other comments? I just had concerns uh, about the common ownership of all of the lots um, and uh, what sort of impact that has on what they're asking for, because it seems to me that, that those three lots have been acting sort of in conjunction with each other sort of forever. And would that then be considered one, one lot for our purposes, should those lots be included in the experience? If, they're, if they need to bleed out into you know, the additional lots, then they should either make that case, um, but you know, make the case and not just have exiting on, you know, on one, one on <coughs> lot. Then they need to amend the variance application exactly. totally to include Right, which was that conversation that we had, and we weren't sure that they would be able to make the argument that a conforming use could not work on the expanded zoning lot. And so I think that's why they retreated from that and said, no, they just wanted to be the original tax lot to be the only zoning lot, and then go on to ask for a parking waiver. And I agree with you that their parking waiver question was unclear because it was unclear how they were determining what the requirement was. And if it turns out that they do need to get the waiver from us, they have to provide some sort of a parking demand study. And it, it's not enough to say, 
the survey that the area is well served by mass transit and other restaurants in the area don't provide parking that's not a parking demand waiver. right so right. if it turns out that they would have to come to us for an additional waiver they at least have to provide some right. kind of a documentation as to what the demand is going to be here mm -hmm. anybody else I mean, I think what's troubling about this is since the 1960s, somewhere around, this was one, one treated as if a common zoning lot because though the variance was only for lot 10, they acted as if it was for lot 8 and 9. And so I didn't go through the buildings department filings, but, you know, the kind of the rule is if you've treated it as one zoning lot, it is one zoning lot, even exactly. if you don't file a zoning lot description and ownership statement, right? So um, th that means they Im sort of improperly appeared before the board representing that lot 10 was a standalone when really it was a larger zoning lot. And so then, you know, I'm, I'm finding this kind of rather irregular that we were sort of treating it like he, neither here nor there they can't have it both ways um, so we may have to have some sort of restriction placed on eight and nine if it's not going to be added to this zoning law because um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it is in common ownership they admit that okay Item number six, ninety-eight oh six BZ, ten forty-five Beach Ninth Street, Queens. Okay. So they submitted a lot of reasons why why they can't make any changes based on what our comments were last time. Um, with respect to the rooftop mechanicals, I still don't see any reason why they can't be pushed back away from the perimeter walls and be clustered the way the rooftop plan reads. Is each mechanical unit lives in this lovely little chamber of its own very comfortably i don't see why like we see on so many other buildings they can't be gathered together and not each one be fenced around and have another kind of way of access um, the way they've got it now children are playing in between the mechanical equipment which is not exactly desirable um, and um, and if they were clustered together, the, the apparent height would be reduced because you're not seeing the fencing right up against the edge. Um, so in order to move on with this, I'd like the mechanical engineer to come to the hearing so we could discuss this. Um, also, the elevations don't accurately depict the impact of the mechanical equipment and their enclosures on building height. Um, the drawings only show the fencing for the play area, but not for the mechanical equipment, so that's really misrepresenting. Um, drawing P14 was added, showing a detail through the ceiling, but I'm not sure how that was supposed to help the argument. I actually don't know what P14 was for. Um, they didn't provide a building section, which is what we asked for before. It helps us understand better what's going on in the floor-to-floor -floor heights. Um, the, there was a framing diagram and details of approved conditions provided. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the window wall condition. There's a strange detail, one and two on of S102, which looks like there's a wall, a CMU wall located in front of a window. I don't understand the detail at all. It's very strange. Um, uh, they apparently are going to be submitting more structural information, but it won't be in time for us to review it. They're going to be submitting um, what the structure would be like if they were allowed to increase the floor to fly floor height. Oh, they did do. They submitted two yes. framing details. They submitted in the last couple of days. Friday. Now? Afternoon. Oh, Friday, I didn't see it. Okay. And, but they didn't do the different, they're still working on the cost on estimates, the cost. Okay. which they're supposed to bring tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, so it's hard for us to review it last second. Um, in terms of the urban study, um, there's this urban history of Rockaway, which was charming to read, but completely irrelevant to what is the urban character today. Um, you might use the urban history of Rockaway if you're making a landmarks argument, but that's not what neighborhood character is based on. If you tear down the whole neighborhood, it doesn't mean that the character of the neighborhood is what was standing, you know, 100 years ago or something. 
Um, so the overwhelming character of this neighborhood is low rise. So you have to be careful how you disrupt that neighborhood with taller buildings. I note that adjacent to the property and across the street are, is a four um, and a four story plus basement with a high parapet apartment building, two of them. Um, I think if you were actually trying to make an argument for this, the most useful would be to know the actual height of the building on Dinsmore from gray to the top of the parapet. That would actually be measured using a laser or climbing to the roof and dropping a tape down instead of going through the history of Rockaway, which I don't understand. Um, and instead of relying on GIS data, because that's always very imperfect and in any event only measures if it's correct to the roof, with, not to the parapet. Um, there's no question for me that the apparent height of, the, um, of this proposed building will be exacerbated by the play area and the mechanical fencing, and that if you look at building typologies in the area, they use decorative high parapet walls to conceal mechanicals, so maybe that would help. Um, to take a look at that and look at that, uh, those other two buildings, how tall are they really, apparently, right? Well, I, I looked at that character study and um, I actually thought that the history of the way in which Far Rockaway was developed was kind of helpful in supporting their statement about the fact that you have all of these tall buildings that are actually scattered and just thrown in haphazardly around amongst the lower buildings. Mm -hmm. So although the character, they did acknowledge that the character is predominantly low rise simply by saying that you do have tall buildings that are just here and there and surrounded by short buildings, but I found it kind of helpful to see the table that they had that showed the average distance between the tall buildings and the low rise right next mm -hmm. to it, which led me to think to myself, okay, it's not going to be a, a completely unusual situation if you do have this high rise building that's located next to a, a two and a half story home on the side. Mm -hmm. So I was... You know, I was like, okay, this is a creative way of reanalyzing the situation. Okay. I'm open. Okay. okay. I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Audrey Brown, and the, I think the Urban Study document was uh, creative in the way it analyzed uh, the urban context. And while in its abutting area there are buildings that are of varying height, some ranging from two stories to five and six, but the history of our rockways does good indicate that there, there is a smack, you know, there is like pepper throughout the mm -hmm. entire island, these tall buildings next to these really low rise. And um, so I, I, I think um, this will not be totally out of the ordinary um, in terms of the context of mm -hmm. our rockway. And it's not that the height is compared to some of the other examples that have been cited where the heights are vastly different. Here it's not that out of the realm of some of the existing buildings that are there. Um, so I, I, I'm i kind of leaning towards that argument and, and, mm -hmm. and I'm comfortable mm -hmm. working that way. So I, I would like to see them though give us the height to the top of the parapet. That way we'll have sure. something to hold sure. on to in terms of what's going on right on the same block. And then also, it looks better. I mean, if you conceal all the junk behind parapets, I don't know why that's not happening anymore. It was such a good design approach. Yes, um, and I think that would definitely add to the argument of the urban context and mm -hmm. where um, using some of the old urban design elements to kind of box in the mechanical spaces, and that, that would kind of help the argument. Um, I'd like them to confirm the, the heights of some of the mechanical and the elevator bulkhead as well. So I, I have a feeling that elevator bulkhead is undersized. We have an elevator that goes to the roof. There's going to be you know, some overrun area plus mm -hmm. the, the mechanical machine room. So I don't think that they've accounted for all of the height that that might, mm -hmm. might be. So. Just to verify the heights of, of all our mechanical <laughs> Um, Commissioner Montanez, did you want to add anything about the information, the structural, whatever, whatever? Um, well, I'm waiting to see what the estimates provide, um, the cost estimates, and see how that confirms their request. Okay. But again, I, 
I'm not all that concerned about the height increase as long as the apparent height is not much higher than what they're asking for because I did feel that this far Rockaway community as explained in the study was sort of haphazardly developed in a random manner with some tall buildings next to shorter buildings and it didn't seem that much out of character to me. Okay. And then um, I did notice, granted it's, it's, a, it's a Google search, but when I went on Google Street View, I saw a photo of the approved building under construction, um, and, but it, the sign shows residential um, and um, I'm wondering if the sign is still there instead of doesn't tell you what the actual building is going to be. When I visited the site, there was no construction. It was just a big pit. Yeah, big pit. So, okay, so Google Street View had something a little bit further along than a pit with a sign in front of it that shows the, a picture of the building. So I was in the right place. Mm -hmm. And it and says residential. residential coming soon kind of thing. So I'm concerned about misleading the community. Uh, <laughs> so I hope that sign's not there anymore and I'd like a picture actually to show that it's been removed. Um, or to add tells the truth. Okay. New cases, item number 720197BC, 11902, Rockaway Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Um, just pointing out there's an error in the statement of facts about the zoning, rezoning history. It says that it's a change from an R32 to a C23 to an R32 to a C23. So that's a mistake. It could be corrected. Um, there's a denial from, the, from DOB for street trees, side yard, parking, loading, which are not discussed in the statement of facts and need to be. Um, the community board noted that it wants street trees planted, which should be planted, unless there's some reason why they can't be planted. Um, the statement of facts did, I found, did not make clear at all what was waived in the initial variance or provide info on the amount of floor area on the site. Um, as I understand it from the approved plans, an eight foot side yard was required and two feet provided in the C2 district and the portion in the R district had no governing bulk regulation, but proposed three foot of front and four foot of side and no rear yard and less parking than was required. All of that needs to be clarified in the statement. Um, the trash enclosure that's shown on the plans looks smaller than what we see in the photos. Um, they should show on the plan where loading occurs and how trucks maneuver on the site. Um, they need to provide proof that DEP had signed off on the sampling protocol and that remediation was conducted according to DEP requirements as stated in the conditional negative declaration. Um, I note on the BIS website and in the application that there are lots of elevator violations, but for the life of me, couldn't find the elevator on the plans. <laughs> I'm not sure even why there would be an elevator, frankly. I don't <laughs> think so. Um, so uh, it's funny that if there isn't an elevator, why even in the statement of facts it would mention the elevator violations. Um, the stockade fencing needs to be replaced. Um, the storage building is in bad shape and needs to be painted. Uh, and the landscaping needs to be replaced and filled and maintained. Anybody else? Um, there were these uh, left-hand sign, uh, left-hand no-turn uh, no sign that was required, and it, uh, it wasn't clear from the photos, and I have to apologize when I went on the site visit, I forgot to look for it, so um, I would like to know whether that's there and where it is and if a photograph can be provided. I think the, I visited the site and I think the paved area is in rather poor condition. I think it should be resurfaced and the parking space is restriped. Uh, I'd like to know how many street trees are actually going to install and what is the requirement. And I believe there's also um, an appeals case aff affiliated with this site, if they could explain, 188-98A, because it wasn't mentioned at all. 
Hill. Okay. Item number 8, 4-98 BC, 12704 Guy Rule Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Um, I need that. I'd like them to provide proof of the DEP sign off of the sampling protocol and the remediation measures which were required by the conditional neg negative declaration. Um, they should replace and maintain the planting and remove all the debris from the site perimeter and maintain the site debris free. I mean, again, you know, you take a picture of a site and you don't even clean it up for the photo. Everyone knows you should do that. <laughs> um, they should describe the hours of trash pickup and truck deliveries. Um, the required in the approval, the, in the approval was 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. for trash and 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. for delivery. They should confirm whether that's still the schedule. It's sort of a broad schedule, actually. Um, the statement of facts, again, did not make clear at all what was waived on the initial variance or provide information on the amount of floor area in the site. Um, so I understand from the approved plans that there was no governing bulk regulations in the R3, but that a six foot and seven foot side yards, six foot and 16 foot front yards and no rear yard was approved, and that 35 parking spaces were provided. That should all be explained in the statement of facts. Um, they need to provide information on the signage compliance under the current zoning, and um, they need to correct the reference to street trees on the plans. It should be zoning resolution 37-921. I think the numbers are switched. I think it says 291. Um, and this provision, it, by the way, is for perimeter trees, not street trees. So trees on site. And I don't understand why more such trees can't be provided. There's plenty of room for them. And they should provide a planting plan and specify the type and number of plantings and show, show all the planting beds clearly. There, actually, there, there is, are no landscaping yeah. plants there now. Right. They just do that. So right. they really need to plant. Yeah. Yes. And now's the season. So. Right. And on their original drawings, they've got a note that concerned exterior brick facade. Um, the new drawings don't have that note, so I'm wondering, was that some sort of condition that the building remain as, you know, a brick facade of some kind? Mm -hmm. And similar to the other site, this site should be um, resurfaced and restriped. Mm. It's in bad shape. Item number 92804BZ, 62 Cooper Street, Manhattan. Cooper Square, Manhattan. Um, we have the engineer's fire alarm and sprinkler sign offs, but um, I know, unless I'm misunderstanding, that the December 2015th fire department sprinkler test appears to have only been done in the residential areas, not the PCE. It sort of checks off that it's the residential hallways and things like that. Um, they should uh, demonstrate that the 2005 recommendations by Acoustalog were actually installed. Um, there, there's a 2010 TCO that lists the health club but doesn't mention the special permit or the conditions as was required. Um, and by 2015, when they got another TCO, this special permit had expired, so essentially the health club was eliminated from the TCO entirely. Um, the sprinkler and fire alarm notes on the plan should indicate have been installed, assuming that they have been installed. Um, and I'd like confirmation, uh, which I'm sure they didn't reach out because it's not normally a requirement of our notification, but the building residents need to be notified that there's a hearing about the continuation of this PCE, so they have an opportunity to comment on vibration and noise issues if there are any. Anybody else? Um, the, there was a 2005 acoustical recommendation that was uh, stated, and, mm -hmm. I, and I would like to know if that was implemented or was. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't. We can't we don't tell. Know that, right? No way to know. Right. Okay. So I didn't miss anything. Okay. No, no, no. You didn't miss it. There's no way to know that it was implemented. Right. That was. Okay. Appeals calendar decision items, item number 10, 
35-15A, 2001 Barktill Avenue, the Bronx. Okay. Um, we're going to reopen this, I think, as I mentioned at the last hearing, because Department of Buildings submitted a whole new argument, which I really think had an effect on it. actually affected my thinking significantly. Um, so, um, so, Department of Buildings um, used two examples of individual pin-mounted letters for Citibank and the city when it changed its logo, um, where the city logo was allowed to replace the Citibank logo as, as long and be of any dimension as long as it fit the total surface area was the same, measuring from the outside of the pin-mounted letters. So. Um, and then they use another example of the M Hotel in Manhattan, where there are individual, there's an M, there's a hotel, there's Manhattan, and the, the DOB viewed that as the entire structure on which these things are mounted, drawing sort of a box around that, was the surface area in which the sign could be located, That's what they called the sign box parameters in terms of just describing what's inside and what you measure. And then there was the, um, the Knickerbocker beer sign was another one, which eventually became the History, History Channel yeah. sign. Again, where they were measuring the individual shapes in there, but then collecting them together and considering that a whole one sign within the sign parameters. Um, so, easier for me if I just read what my notes are. So as was pointed out by the appellant, all of those examples are legal non-conforming signs, the modification of which is subject to specific standards that are set forth in Article 5, Chapter 2. One of those standards, however, limits the surface area of the sign and um, to that which existed prior to the sign becoming non-conforming. So though it's true, it's the nonconforming signs are regulated in a different chapter. Surface area is one of the things that are regulated by that chapter. And so it's important to know how is the surface area measured in those cases. Um, so it, it's not irrelevant. They, they were saying it's irrelevant. I don't agree that it's irrelevant. Um, DOB asks us to focus on sign panels located on a single structure um, as opposed to sign panels on multiple structures and the distance between those signs or whether they should be read as a single sign. Um, with the rooftop signs that they presented, they are multiple panels, so like the H and so on, on a single structure with the text boxes aggregated. So they take all of them together. Um, DOB urges us to look at the separate graphic components, which in quotes, on the single sign structure as a single sign with the surface area of its individual components added together as they were on the rooftop signs in the examples they provided. With that approach, the distance between the graphic components is no longer an issue. So it doesn't matter whether they're 12 inches apart or 18 inches apart, um, uh, there isn't a separate sign on that structure, right? Um, you can also then ignore the content in that case. So, so, in my, so the question really is, is that reading consistent with Section 1210 definition of surface area? Both DOB and the appellant, um, I think, should look at um, the second two paragraphs on the 1210 definition of surface area and see whether these, which clarify these two paragraphs, which clarify how to deal with multiple sign faces on a single structure inform the analysis. It appears to assume that everything enclosed within the frame of the sign structure is a single sign, even when it's double-faced. So that, so back, going back to like the 60s when people were thinking about signs on monopoles, um, there was a monopole and then there was sometimes a two-faced sign. And so it, it seems clear from that second paragraph that they were viewing the sign as what's on that in that frame and if it was double face back to back then it's only one sign and but if it was 
sort of a triangle, then you counted that other side, right? So, so there was sort of, they were giving a clear instruction about what to do with monopoles, for example. Um, and obviously well before they, people thought of multiple screens. Um, so I think, um, okay. so I think that if we look at it that way, then the signs that were provided by the appellant, where there are those separate signs mounted on the sides of buildings, um, it, this thinking is still cons consistent with that thinking. So if you look at that whole outside frame as the structure onto which individual components of a sign are mounted, that's not any different from looking at those sort of um, collected images that we see, like the core sign, where there's a piece, there's a core sign on the top and a next one and a next one, because um, there's a frame around each portion. So each of them is a separate structure into which different kind of messages could go. So the content isn't relevant. It doesn't matter whether it's coordinated image or not. The, the thing that matters is it's a completely separate structure. Um, and I think also that you don't really need to go to the rooftop of Citibank to find examples of pin-mounted letters where the surface area of the sign is measured within the imaginary text box. Every sign that's made up of pin-mounted letters in the city is measured that way. Um, that I know from my own experience. I know that that's actually how DOB measures those signs. So, um, so you need to ask why that is and whether that is a reasonable interpretation of the statute since each letter or symbol, sometimes it's a logo and then a word or sometimes it's a, a word and then a little slogan, you, um, why, why each of those, because each of those is separated from the other and doesn't always have an articulated continuous perimeter around it like the same color or something like that that encloses the extreme limits of the writing or representation which is in the definition since the symbols and letters may be pin mounted, for example, to a limestone wall. So that's just the continuity of the whole building. So you're making the imaginary text box without knowing, say, that there's, say, a black, black background behind it that tells you that that's the text. Um, let's see. Uh, and, and just sort of just the end of, in, I agree that with the appellant that the DOB has been inconsistent with its analysis, especially re with respect to the example they used of the deal signs. But I think really that the reason for that is that DOB has in fact lost track of the direction that the zoning resolution provides by relying solely on the single continuous perimeter phrase and by ignoring the rest of the sentence. Um, it's past practice with respect to monopoles and rooftop signs and with pin-mounted letters made up of individual letters to create a writing. So I think kind of our job is to redirect, get DOB to focus again on what the text says and in that maybe we clear up some of this confusion. With the deal sign, I thought, um, you know, looking at the objection sheet that DOB produced, it's their kind of emphasis is on the two separate attachments and it's almost on two separate surfaces which is why they required two separate sign applications or two separate they considered it two separate signs which I felt followed their logic mm -hmm. it was more an attachment issue than you know looking at the content of the sign so they're on different planes those yeah if you I, if you look at the um, well, they're different. They're different attachments. They're different mountings. They're different mm -hmm. types of mountings. Okay, but the different mountings. I mean, so for instance, you could say on the History Channel, the, there are the separate mountings on that right. big frame, mm -hmm. right? So right. if you go by separate mountings, then that doesn't work within the. Well, it could be a different type entirely. But I think they're going using the example of the History Channel. I mean, that. H is totally different type from the rest of the document, but in its assessment, it assumed a drawing, a drawing a box around the entirety of it and used that as a parameter. And I think that was a very 
telling, um, and, I, and I think that's a reasonable argument, and, and I could see the consistency in that argument. And it goes back to the definition of the surface area, which says, you know, continuous perimeter enclosing the extreme limits of writing, representation, emblem, or any figure of similar character together with any material or color forming an integral part of the display or used to differentiate such signs from the background again. So it, you could have spaces in between, but the fact that you're looking at it in its entirety, and that is a, clearly a very good definition of the surface area, and I think that is something I feel we need to keep that in mind, and I, I, I'm assuming DOB is using that in its assessment when it's saying drawing the box, and, 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 and then applying that to this term um, of, of the section 62, um, you know, 32, 622, where even though it's saying an advertisement sign, I think it's just a subject matter. It's like a category. It's, the zoning is defining a category. If you have an advertisement sign, then you need to maintain a distance. It's not saying one advertisement sign per that distance, which is what the argument is being presented by the opponent. It really should be looking at the, what the surface area of that entirety of the sign should be. So I, I think the drawing the box and using that as an argument to kind of put it all together in one comprehensive packet makes sense. I, I think Diobi's argument was very helpful. And uh, while I do see that in the past there have been inconsistency, I was looking at um, um, a, a, law case, uh, a case that was uh, the Clear Channel Outdoor Inc. case that was uh, uh, there. In that document, it clearly says, um, the document went further to state that a billboard can be perceived an, as an aesthetic harm. Such aesthetic harms are necessarily um, subjective, defining objective evaluation, and must be carefully scrutinized to determine if they are only a public rationalization of uh, uh, permissible purposes. So this is, again, the distance from the arterial highway, which is a very important element um, to maintain. So I, I do think it's not something, a clear cut uh, argument that may, not, may be applied everywhere, and then one could say, yes, in this case, DOB did not adhere to that regulation. But I, I think the intent, which has been there in the zoning re resolution from the 1940, where signs should not be permitted within certain distance of an arterial highway, but maintaining that distance, I think has been kept in the text and has been written in the text in that way, and has, and, and I think. DOB is trying to maintain that consistency in this particular case and in using the drawing the box. So I think there is uh, there's a strong argument. So, you, But you're talking about it's consistent with the intent because you don't look to intent if the language is clear. So, right, you only look to intent when you don't actually know right. what the agency I, intended. Right, but right? the intent has, I think there's consistency with the intent. Okay. Well, for me, I think there, the DOB's argument begged a couple of questions. Um, the first for me was that they really didn't um, do what I asked them to do, which was really to look at um, truly similar installations. And there, there are a few in the city, um, and right by arterial highways that are sort of mounted in the same way. Um, and I just wanted them to take a look to see if they had calculated the square footage in the same way, or whether they had decided that each one, each one of these, these video screens was separate. Mm -hmm. um, Do you know of any? Yeah, I gave it to them. Oh, um, okay. I gave them a list. There's one by Yankee Stadium on the Major Deegan. There's actually one that's down the street from um, Bartow. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of at the uh, the shopping center I there. Think their answer was that those were accessory signs and not advertising signs because yeah. they were located on the zoning lot. But I'm not sure that but that this, should make a difference. And so, I'm not sure it makes right. a difference either. We're talking about calculating, right. you know, the area of a sign exactly. before you even get to the determination. Right. Of so what it's kind of it's sign. not really about the yeah. kind. It's about how they determine the size, especially the one on the Major Deegan, which mm. is like sitting right on the Major Deegan. So maybe they they could go back and take a look at that. But also then, secondly, the idea that uh, you're looking at this monopole single structure, and then what happens from that. So it begs the question, well, if I've devised you know, a pattern of, of these video screens, and then I figured out how to mount them some way separately from each other, or, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess 
the absurd result would be to do 27 little polls. But, but you know, to do it in, in somewhat a different manner in which you have more than one structure. So therefore, does that, how, how does that work? Because in my mind, if you're looking at you know, separate structures and then looking at the, the sign on top of that, that individual monocle, okay, I could have 27 individual monocles. Does that mean now that I calculate those signs differently, do I have a different, um, you know, uh, do I have a different outcome? And I think you might. So I, I'm wondering, you know, about that, whether or not that, that whole single structure monopole, this is what we look at and this is how we would then um, determine the size of the sign. If I designed it differently, I might have a different determination. That necessarily shouldn't be. I had a similar question after reading the drawing the box as to if you, if one were to have, let's say, 27 different monopoles with 27 different signs, each one meeting that requirement, uh, would then the box be drawn across all the 27 um, to determine um, that would, or for that matter, let's say I have one sign today, and then two years later I put up another sign on the zoning lot uh, at different time, then would the drawing the box include that other sign? Um, they might be separated by five feet, three feet. There is a physical a, they're, they're two separate monopoles. Mm -hmm. B, there's a physical difference. I, I think a 12-inch difference, as, as being shown in this particular case, it's, it's a wash. When you're going to drive down that highway, it's not going to be visible. But a, a difference of a sig bigger um, difference between the signs may make a difference, which again, with technology, again, may become a wash. Um, and but we're case trying in point, to get away from the, is it four inches or 12 inches or three feet? Right, or and whatever, I think that should be order. irrelevant. I think one needs to keep in mind is that with the change of technology, so much can happen. Uh, and the path tunnel advertisement signs are a very good case. If you individually look at them, if it's an aesthetic situation, they are very far apart. But when the train is in motion, it all reads like a one continuous sign. So the technology is changing, and so having the distance of whether it's 12 inch, one foot, three foot, five foot, is, uh, should not be the fact. It's mm -hmm. a question of how are you using drawing the box in such situation on a zoning lot, which may have multiple monopoles. Yes. You want to? I, I still am not there yet. I still want to know how Department of Buildings calculates the square footage of a sign, regardless of whether it's an advertising sign or an accessory business sign. And I agree with Commissioner Hinkson that there are lots of examples of monopole signs, particularly around shopping centers, that are several stores that are in that shopping center on one monopole. And I'd like to know, is that calculated as one sign or several signs? And um, like you, Chair, I want to see some kind of a standardization to their approach to how they calculate the square footage of a sign. So I think that that would be one area that they need to really lock down for me as being standardized. Great. Thank you all. Continued hearing items. Item number 11, 308A, 3935 27th Street, Queens. <laughs> Okay, this one. Uh, <coughs> they submitted on the end of January a timeline, and we just need an update. <coughs> they are making progress. It's just it's slow. <coughs> hmm? Tomorrow you're going to get that. Item number 12, 14115A through 15515A, Cheevers Lane and Guybridge Avenue, Staten Island. Okay, they provided the revised BSA, fire department, builders pavement plans that are coordinated with each other, which we asked them to do. And the architect verified that um, the city planning subdivision approval was all that was necessary. And um, uh, they are not removing any trees that are not as of right to be removed. Anybody else? Uh, they're revising the site plan again the fire department had a comments on the last submission oh. 
So they revised it. The fire department submitted something, but we sent it to the applicant. The applicant's supposed to submit a revised plan that coordinates with the fire department. There was a parking discussion. So will we have that by tomorrow? I will we have that by tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, there's a thing about the voluntary parking and no parking in the folder. Okay. Back. It was a thing there. Okay. So maybe what we do is, hope if we maybe move this to a later point in the calendar to give them time to submit officially, otherwise we can't, we can't move. We can't close, sorry. We can close, but we can't do it out. Yeah. Which would be a shame. Yeah. Okay. New cases, item number 13, 106, 107, 15A, 149th Street, Queens. I'm waiting still for DLT. Sorry. Yeah. DLT. Mm -hmm. We also need the community board recommendation. I didn't see that. Um, community board. We're waiting for the DOT letter, but really the existing house is sitting in the same place FDN. as the also proposed. FDNY. Right. But the existing house is sitting in the site. Yeah. Do you have a small discrepancy between your builder's pavement plan and your actual BSA plans? And concerning the curb cuts, they don't line up with the parking spots, and they're only eight foot wide in the builder's pavement plan and the building. In the BSA plans, there are 10 foot curb cuts, and they don't line up in the same area. So they may want to correct one of them. Okay. And then I was confused because I don't see why this application needs a GCO 36. I didn't either. Because it seems to front on 149th Street, which is a matte street, right. and I thought they only needed a GCL 35. I thought that the DOB objection was very confused. It was. They just didn't <laughs> seem to understand what they were objecting to. It's just building in the bed of a matte street. Right. So I think they should clarify that. Yeah. Because we're. I don't think they need the GCL 36 at all. No. Unless, unless. Ash, in, or is this Ash? No, yes. 149th Street. One, no, no, no. It's Ash that's being, is the, is the obstructed, is the map street in which they're building. Mm -hmm. Unless Ash isn't actually a map street, in which case I don't even know what we're doing here. But they're still fronting on 149th right. Street. No, but I mean, there was a statement about that the street is not a map street. In the, in the DOB objection, it said something about it being facing or being on a, a street that's not a map street. An open or an unmapped, or I, I didn't I understand. It said 149 yeah. Street is not duly placed on the city map. Right, but it, according to the surveyor, it's placed. So very confusing. Something's wrong. So okay. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> Item number 14, 428 St. Mark's Plate, Staten Island. I'm still waiting for DOT. Right. And. and I think I yeah. right. And again, the house is sitting on the street, on the street already, so it's not like, yeah. Um, the only thing, I didn't actually have any comments about this except to say that there's this funny little office of 366 square feet that opens onto a covered patio. And I just think, what, what in the world is that? And so I would like a note added to that drawing that says something to the effect that DOB sh shall review covered patio area complies with zoning and code because I find that a little bit of a suspicious um, decision. <laughs> and then the, the community board requested that um, right. they store their trash internally if they could okay. comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zoning calendar, item number 15. 101 14BZ, 1975 51st Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Okay. Um, I thought the, the submission was extremely responsive to our comments from the last hearing. So I didn't have any more comments, though I have a lot of conditions that I'd like to include which I could read here or we can talk about tomorrow. There's just one um, maybe a clarification. The FAR amount um, changed in the proposed plan, yeah. and, um, and that was not stated in the, the statement of fact. 
Oh. Um, so I, I think this needs to be updated um, because I think because of that uh, bridge um, that's connecting the through the shaft is what's adding to that additional flow oh. area. Um, Raya, that they, they took your suggestion yeah, just yeah. to add a corridor through the shaft, and that which would allow for <coughs> the rooms to get expanded, and and that seemed that the plan really seems uh -oh. to work. But that <laughs> adds to the floor area, which is indicated in the plan, but not in the statement of fact. Okay, it but just are we still good, good with floor areas? That's question. Right. Does that mess us up in any way? Is what I want to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So. Need to take a quick look at that. <coughs> Make sure we're not needing any other waivers or anything like that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Or maybe there's a mechanical that offsets it, possibly too. Okay. Item number sixteen two zero three fifteen BZ forty four Union Square East Manhattan. Um, I recuse from this. Oh, you are. I am. Yeah. Uh, in response to the board's comments the last time um, as we closed, the applicant provided the board drawings indicating the inclusion of a storage room where tenants will store their trash until pickup. Uh, the applicant states that they will comply with ADA and local law rules concerning accessibility, including installing necessary elevators between the cellar first and second floors. Um, the applicant provided a space for a future elevator that communicates with the first floor and the cellar. All building deliveries are to be made uh, on East 17th Street. And the applicant revised the comparables that were provided. Um, any grant would it be conditioned on, on those above items. Uh, do we have any other open issues with this? We're good? No, they revised the uh, financials. But with, that provided supporting documentation that showed that the proposed scenario had the minimal return, the minimum return that an investor would seek. So I'm satisfied. Good. Um, and we can list conditions more cohesively um, tomorrow and have that discussion. Okay. Okay. Bring back the chair. Item number 17, 2414 BZ, 10602 Sutter Avenue, Queens. Uh, they requested an adjournment on this. Item number 1830-14 BZ, 60, John. 61, <laughs> 6101 16th Avenue, Brooklyn. <laughs> um, okay, I know. Uh, sorry, scrolling. Okay, so the building is now proposed at five stories and 70 feet high to the roof, uh, down one story, which is progress. Um, so uh, just the, the as of right is 43 or almost 44 feet. Um, and it's also down from 159,000 square feet to 140,000 square feet, and the as of right is 72,000. Um, with respect to the building height, um, I'd like to know the construction status of the Maple Lane site at 1560 60th Street, which is, according to the approved Department of Building drawings, 70 feet high, which would have a lot of, uh, let's say, would have a lot of effect on my thinking about neighborhood character if you've got a building essentially across the street that's the same height as the proposed. Um, so if they could provide construction progress photos, that would be very helpful. Um, um, there's still a mikvah in the school, and I don't think we've gotten to the point where we can understand the link between a school for children and a mikvah for adults. Um, not to mention the fact that the disabled access to the mikvah is via the, a lift and elevator with direct access into the school. Um, the, I think this is an improper mingling of adults and children um, and proof that it's not the norm to mingle functions 
are the BSA decisions for standalone mikvahs submitted by the applicant. They're mostly standalones, sometimes associated with a synagogue. None of these are located in the school buildings, so far as I was able to tell. Um, there are many functions on the ground floor of this school building that could have gone into the cellar to reduce the building height, like all the kitchen services and trash services and all that could have been in this cellar. Um, there's also an adult seminary on the same floor as the ninth through 12th graders. I personally find this troubling to mix children with non-faculty adults on the same floor and sharing the same rooms, labs, computer rooms. In addition, if you look at the schedule, the use of the specialty rooms by the seminar deprives school children of those functions. For example, the science lab and home science lab and home ec rooms are not offered to middle schoolers because the seminar is um, seminary is using them. Um, you know, ADA access was added. Uh, one elevator now goes to the roof. Um, you need to show the height of the bulkheads on elevations. Um, um, I'm wondering whether the refrigerated trash room is adequate to handle all the dry and perishable trash needs of the school, um, or is there a dry trash area, another one separate? Um, also, uh, they should su provide the support calculations to, for, to determine how much trash needs to be stored. Um, I noted again that the pedestrian analysis in the traffic and pedestrian analysis didn't take into account parents accompanying children, which we talked about in prior hearings. Um, with respect to the modal splits, um, we need, um, for transportation, we need backup information. Um, we're going to send that material to DOT for review. It's a significant amount of buses, and so it's going to have an impact um, on the area traffic and parking. They did provide a letter from the owner of 1454 62nd Street, which is located about three blocks away in an M district and has a CFO for a public parking lot. Uh, and the agreement states that it, the letter states that it has an agreement with the school to allow parking for 11 buses. In order for this to be persuasive, we need a copy of a lease for that. You can't just say it today and change your mind tomorrow. Um, uh, there, uh, I, I'd like to see a school bus pickup and drop off operational schedule, including a site plan showing the number of buses that can pull up to the curbside at a given time. The statement of fact says that um, currently 10 buses arrive at a time, um, but there are 18 buses at peak hours. So deliveries and drop-offs and pickups need to be staggered to not impede traffic. We've seen for some other schools a very carefully arranged staggered drop-off and pickup system, which we need to see here, and, and it needs to be incorporated into the conditions. So that has to be provided. Um, there are several air quality emission modeling questions that DEP raised um, that the consultant still needs to address and they also need to address DEP's noise comments. Um, and those were my questions. Anybody um, else? I wanted to get a better understanding of where, uh, along which street uh, the buses will be dropping up. Will it be along 61st Street or not? And the reason for that question is because the elevator has been now located along 61st Street. So if that's the primary entrance, uh, then an ADA, uh, elevator is located near enough. Otherwise, if it's on the other street, one would have to go quite a distance to access the um, elevator um, for handicap accessibility. So that's my reason for asking that question. And again, I'm not sure, but in the plan, it seems that there's a separate handicap lift that's been provided from the ground floor to the MICWA. It wasn't clear from the drawing, so I just wanted to clear. Um, there's one in the sort of parking area and then there's another one direct from the street both of them go to the mikvah that's where and then it's right opposite the elevator that takes you right into the school that's where i got really nervous okay yeah that i think the plan yeah. was not right so okay anybody else 
Item number 19, 102 14 BC, 4017 Avenue P, Brooklyn. Um, I thought they were very, extremely responsive to our comments and they made many good changes to the plans to reduce the apparent mass of the addition. In particular, the vestibule was reduced in depth. The lower roof was canted back at the rear um, and the accessible roof area uh, significantly reduced so it's not as inviting for big parties with the synagogue crawling through the bedroom of the rabbi's house. Um, a handicapped lift um, replaces now the ramp so there is more area on the property itself for congregants to mingle after services and a fence around the property is proposed to encourage this so everyone stays inside the fenced area. Um, I note that the furnishing plan still shows the original vestibule at the woman's entrance, um, so it needs to be corrected. And also the second floor plan doesn't reflect the fact that the vestibule was set back about two feet. So you're looking at the roof of the first floor and it is, it's not reflected in the second floor plan. Um, with respect to the vines along the decorative metal fence, um, you need to have a place to plant them. <laughs> So they don't, unless they're plastic, they, they really do need a planting bed. So um, there needs to be a one foot wide planting bed to allow the vines to grow. And they, that bed needs to show in detail plan and detail section. Um, there should be specifications on the metal picket fence. What call, you should call out the materials on the building facades and at the picket fence on the roof setback. Um, all of these must be of high grade suitable to a residential district. So don't go cheap on us. Um, on elevation number 24, um, the full depth of the addition should be shown, even though it will be hidden by, behind the adjacent garage. When you look at that elevation, it looks like the addition is shorter on that side, but in fact, the dash line of the garage is opaque. That's not the convention of how you show that. Um, need to show the noise, show, um, indicate noise and attenuation at the windows and walls to STC 35. Um, we need, um, they're preparing a parking study, but I'm told they need two months to do it, so we're not going to be able to move until we know what's going on with the parking. But in the meantime, the owners need to be looking for a place to park the cars, as was discussed at the last hearing. Um, and then the, we had asked that they look at the argument um, about the impact of this addition on the rear, on other um, yards that are backing up against this site. And the only one they focused on was one of the rear yards. But in fact, this affects three <coughs> properties. Um, so all of them should have been discussed in the analysis. Um, I found actually the analysis quite difficult to understand because there was no map that shows you um, figure ground um, and so everything was relying on Google satellite images which I always find hard to determine like what's the open space which building belongs to which site I find them actually hard to use for this purpose um, so um, yeah and then that's it anybody else I thought those vines were welded into the they what? Welded the, in? Welded <laughs> part of the, the, Welded into the fence. The of the fence. <laughs> oh, <then>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think adding to the comment, uh, the, it's good that the lift has, uh, is being proposed, uh, and which would replace the ramp, um, and that would allow for a more gathering area. But I still think um, uh, consideration should be given to the residents and ensure that m that gathering is minimized outside the premise yeah. because it is close to uh, residential uses and, and, and try to have most of the gatherings within the building and then just use that as a spillover um, area as people are exiting. Okay, so we could make that a condition, right, to minimize congregate, yeah. Also that back terrace. Um, should say for residential use only, not yeah. rabbi's use only. Um, because that oh. has different implications. <coughs> residential use, you're not necessarily going to have the overflow from the institution up there. Even though this is an accessory use, the rabbi's residence is considered as an accessory use, 
that note would still be applicable? Well, I think the intent is is that you're not going to have, you know, 100 people on, on the roof for mm -hmm. some event. So that being the case, I would, I would okay. err on mm -hmm. the side of caution and say residential, which means more residential type uses. Right, as opposed to some official rabbi event, then you could say the rabbi has a big party on the roof or whatever because it's right. rabbi related. Yeah, yeah, okay. That makes sense. So, um, yeah, so we can make a condition. So that, should, that note should be added to the drawings or modified, but then we can make a condition also about the gathering outside should be controlled, monitored and controlled to keep a minimum of people outside. Okay. okay. And one of the elevations, uh, I think you mentioned it on page 24, that, that slant is not shown uh, now that the roof has been, uh, uh, it still shows as something that's going straight up. Oh. Okay. So I think that elevation needs to be corrected. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a cut uh, where instead of having the wall uh, height starting at eight foot, maybe start at seven and then slant, that would have actually reduced that roof terrace a little bit more. Um, but this is a good direction. Okay. The applicant had asked about, uh, had called me about uh, the parking uh, study and, and what level of depth they, they want to go and what kinds of solutions would might be acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they had mentioned things like, what if we just arranged with our neighbors to park, park in the, you know, and that didn't seem to me the, the sort of level of, of uh, sort of study that we needed. We wanted something that, that was a permanent, <coughs> sort of thoughtful solution about mm -hmm. how, how the uh, parking will be handled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. Go. Uh-huh. Item number 20, 229, 14 Measy, 5505 Myrtle Avenue, Queens. Hey, they requested in a, uh, to withdraw this, actually. Okay. Item number 21, 240, 240 14 Measy, 1620 Shore Boulevard, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, I actually was very confused by this submission. There's no mention in the statement of facts about the illegal rear yard addition. No response, which we talked about at length. There's no response at all to any of our comments about the addition being too tall. There's no diagram provided to show that enough of the existing building will be retained to be an enlargement, and no indication of what walls are existing, which to be removed, and which are new. Um, the front parking pad is only 16 foot 5 inches and should be 18 feet. And the third floor has gotten larger instead of smaller when we discussed that the extra height was probably not compatible with the neighborhood. And no argument was made in support of that height. Um, I do note, however, that when I look at the section, the floor to floor heights are minimal. So I don't know really where you could reduce them. Um, I do see that the extent of the cellar was reduced and the windows replaced with flood vents to comply with Appendix G. Um, the rear yard seems to have been increased to 23 foot 7 from something less that was maybe 19 foot 8, but it's not really clear. The dimensions are sort of strange on the drawings. It's this 19 foot 8 floating around in the backyard, but maybe that's a dimension. And the height to the peak is now 45 feet instead of 47, so they did bring it down by two feet. Um, but meanwhile, there's also no request anywhere for the waiver of the rear yard or a DOB denial for a non-complying rear yard. Um, the architect should really come to this because I think there's a lot of confusion about the process here for these 73622s. Anybody else? Um, some of the elevations show the cellar slab below grade. I think they corrected some, but they should correct all of them. It should be at grade. It shouldn't be below grade. Um, I believe the curb cut, they said that DOB has not approved it. They should really dot that in and say, if approved by DOT, but by DOB. And um, regarding the, the parking is going to be in the garage. It's a question of the open area. And there's a significant width of city-owned property in front of the property line here. 
So the question would be, would that be included in some of the open area calculation? I don't know how that's handled. Outside of the property line. Shore Boulevard has deep front yards, and some of it is beyond their property line. Right. right. But it's yeah. a landscaped area. Okay. So <clears throat> would that be allowable to be included as, mm -hmm. as open area? And they are still measuring the uh, perimeter wall height and the building height from the first floor, not from the design flood elevation. They have to correct that on all the plan, all the drawings. Mm -hmm. Twenty-two, three twenty-nine, fourteen BZ, thirteen sixteen Avenue S. Requesting an adjournment. Item number twenty-three, forty-four, fifteen BZ, one forty-four, one forty-five Central Park North, Manhattan. Okay. Um, we need the environmental sign-offs, um, which we don't have yet. <coughs> and um, there was a traffic study that was provided showing that the driveway will not impede with the bus stop. Um, I note that the report states there are currently no articulated buses on this route, so they claim there is ample room for queuing two 40-foot long standard buses. A member of the community, however, provided a photograph showing three buses queuing at the site at, at night. Um, and and you can't predict whether there will be articulated buses. It seems to be the norm. MTA seems to prefer them. Um, so an articulated bus is 62 feet long. So in the event of queuing of two such bu buses, they would block the access to the driveway. Um, there's also a no parking zone, I just want to note, for a long distance along that curb and past the subject building. So it's not that cars would be parked outside of that bus zone. Um, yeah, for, for me, the big issue is that you don't want cars cutting across 110th Street in the westbound lane to go into the garage, um, as that could be dangerous. Um, or it's really the eastbound lane to go into the garage, as that could be dangerous. But I think you actually could control any impediment to the bus circulation by including a traffic light on the inside of the garage that permits exiting when the bus lane is um, um, when the bus lane isn't busy and a light on the outside of the garage that alerts pedestrians to when the garage doors will open, plus a sign forbidding left turns onto 110th Street. Um, in, in fact, according to the study, there are very few cars in this garage that um, might cause conflicts, but I would like um, the consultant to speak to how to manage the cars to avoid conflict with bus queuing, future articulated bus queuing and pedestrian safety, and to the comments from the traffic consultant, Gilchrist Advisors, um, submitted for the neighbors. Um, the plan should also be revised to affect, reflect the signalization systems that were recommended by um, Sam Schwartz's office. Anybody else? I, um, I think my only concern with the one of the questions is the, the articulated bus. I mean, the articulated buses, once they are used, New York City Transit will change almost the bus, uh, the frequency of the buses because of the capacity of an articulated bus is much more than a 40 foot wide, uh, 40 foot long. Uh, so the, the, the chances of that queuing of a 60 and a 40 foot or two articulated buses, those are all very speculative and, and since transit has not done that analysis, I just don't know how that analysis can even be provided in these situations. We, we, we don't know what the modal split is, what the modal capacity <coughs> is, and how um, an articulated bus would affect um, the thing. So that's just my comment. and, and, and I. I, I think whatever will be provided will be too speculative, and I don't think we can use. I don't feel comfortable using that as a guide to make the mm -hmm. determination whether there's enough space. I do agree that that there should be, uh, you know, vehicular management, uh, conflict management um, alternatives should be provided, um, and the fact that this is a 25-foot wide sidewalk, 
when a car is going to come out, I think it will give plenty of opportunity for the pedestrians to know when a vehicle is <coughs> and they can go around it, and otherwise it's not going to completely um, create too much of, uh, mm -hmm. it, it would minimize the conflict. And I'm saying that from the bank that I'm in, where I, we do have a pretty wide, not as wide as a 25 foot, but we do have a 15 foot wide sidewalk, and, and having that sign, we have like a, a yellow a blinking sign when a when a car is stepping out immediately it goes mm -hmm. and so the pedestrians become fully aware mm -hmm. that uh, it's coming right. and okay. anybody else no just with respect to the articulated buses I, I live near 86th Street they queue all the time and what ends up happening is depending on the bus stop sometimes they'll stay at the traffic light on the other side waiting for the side where the bus stop is to clear because there's no place for them to line mm -hmm. up. Um, in this case though, because there's so much no parking area along the street, it seems to me they actually wouldn't have a problem queuing a good point. past the point if the bus drivers were simply instructed, don't line up here, you know? I, I don't really see why that would be an impediment, but that's for a traffic manager to decide. Okay. Item number 24, 202 15 BC, 6469 Broadway, the Bronx. Okay. Um, <laughs> this one will have some comments from our resident traffic expert, um, party <coughs> expert. But um, <laughs> the uh, applicants extensive, provided an extensive stat satellite study. Um, uh, about that showed it's kind of was kind of interesting for me to see how many sources of satellite data that you can get so many many images showing the parking lot next door with available spaces I'll let um, our own Commissioner Otley Brown um, discuss her observations um, about the underutilization of that parking um, and I also note importantly that the zoning for quality at affordability that's about to be passed tomorrow by the city council. Um, um, if that applied to this site, would only require nine parking spaces, which is what is being provided. So actually, um, if this building were built a little bit later in the story, it would have provided nine spaces, and that would have been as of right, and that would have been the end of it. So, um, Commissioner Otley Brown. Since the last hearing, I actually, since I do live in the neighborhood, took several trips almost daily to witness the parking situation around this site, probably within a quarter of a mile radius of this site, and also taking special note of what was going on in the parking lot of the adjacent senior residence. And I have noticed in all of my visits, of which I actually have documented several of them, there were never more than seven parking spaces taken within the parking lot that's just to the north. And every single time that I have visited, I have noticed numerous parking spaces on Broadway, on Mishula Avenue, in all directions of the project site. So I'm not seeing what the opposition was raising as an issue. Okay. Just to add to that, I mean, I think all of us have done, given, done various site visits, and I, for one, I, I also noticed a similar thing. It was just on a day, on a random weekday, and I noticed the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, a huge problem, um, unless you're there at one o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in Kent Park to go to the burger place, but that's about it. Um, I, I would suggest that. Um, Perhaps there's the ability for um, the applicant to reach out to their neighbor, and if there's ever a time in which they are going to require additional parking that they can't accommodate. For instance, they have an event they, at, at the building, they know that they might be getting additional parking. Um, perhaps um, they can speak with their neighbor and be able to utilize some of their parking. Um, but it's actually not allowed. It's not a public parking. Right. If there's restaurant parking going on at the neighbor, it's, it's illegal. No, no, it's not a restaurant to, parking. But no, 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 but it's not a public parking the, lot. No, no, just in terms of neighborly access. Right. 
that if if because their neighbor is a like institution so if um, you know they would see fit and they needed additional parking that it might be available to them. I actually don't think that's legal frankly and there's plenty of spaces yeah. actually on the street mm -hmm. okay but I think I think to the point is it doesn't seem as if there's a parking issue based on incredible empirical data on the part of <laughs> on the demand <laughs> on the part of one very let's say committed commissioner <laughs> <laughs> So way more than what normally parking studies allow. You know, if we talk about the parking study that was conducted, that was submitted to us for, I forget which, um, rezoning, um, even a parking consultant does not go with a little clicker with the same intensity that Commissioner Otley Brown <laughs> went. <laughs> with all of the photo backup. Photo backup, a lot of photo backup, which we're happy to share if needed. And, and just to add to one of the comments that was raised by the opposition is that the commercial floor area will create, add to a lot of traffic, which I definitely do not think is going is a situation. This is not a destinational retail. This is an extremely small commercial footprint. So it is going to be someone passing by or, or living in the neighborhood. This is not going to create a traffic hassle. So mm -hmm. I, I don't even think that question should be raised. It's more yeah. likely to be a walker who goes yes. to this mm -hmm. little place. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? No. I want to thank also all of everyone for <laughs> their diligent efforts at site visits. <laughs> <laughs> Especially well, this one was relatively well. simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. New cases, item number one, 333 14 EZ, 2323 East 5th Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, well, I, I would like to see for the threshold um, calculations and a diagram showing the amount and percentage of existing floor area and perimeter walls being retained so we can establish that this is indeed an enlargement of an existing building. Um, I'm also not getting the argument about how the six foot 11 inch side yard can be reduced to five feet if the total side yard width will be seven foot nine when it should be nine feet. Um, section 23-48 is clear that it only allows a reduction in the total width of side yards, mm -hmm. not the minimum required side yard. And the 28 foot wide site allows a total side yard reduction of four feet um, so from, from 13 feet, that would be 9 feet. Plus, you have to establish that this lot was owned separately from other lots since 1961, which needs to be done. Maybe it's obvious because you look at the Sanborn map, but still it needs to be established with deeds. Um, with respect to the floor area ratio, there are a total of five houses on the social block with FARs equal or greater than the ask of 1.24 FAR, and seven houses on the social block have 48% or greater lot coverage. So those two asks are in line with um, the character of the neighborhood. With respect to the rear yard study, um, it isn't clear to me from the figure ground um, image what, which buildings or which structures are one story and what are two-story incursions in the required rear yard. Most, if not all, appear to be from photographs, one-story garages. Um, and um, adjacent lot 61 is built deeper than the subject to a height of two stories, but the survey doesn't indicate how deep. Um, the site plan shows the adjacent house has a two-story section shorter than what's proposed here. Um, the case here, I really think, is for a one-story um, structure to the 20-foot setback. And then on the second floor, um, it should line up with or be close to that of the neighbor. Um, and um, the, the OP special purpose district wasn't discussed at all anywhere in the application. And um, uh, it's not mentioned on the zoning calculation sheet, so I can't tell whether it was considered in this analysis. Um, we need to know that. Um, and then the street elevation that shows the adjoining houses, um, there must be an error in the measurements because it shows the adjacent house is supposedly only eight inches taller 
than the proposed, but the way it's rendered is over two feet taller. Um, so it makes me question the entire analysis. So both the height of the adjoining house and of the proposed in context has to be verified and the drawing corrected if necessary. Anybody else? Um, well, I would agree. Um, definitely they need to show that um, this was an existing small lot and was separately owned in 1961. Um, they come to sort of that conclusion in the um, side yard section, but they don't discuss it further up, which they, they should, and, and give us some evidence. Um, the existing foundation walls um, are now significantly thicker. Um, right. Is there, I guess, going to sort of beef up those walls? But it's not clear whether or not um, the existing walls are actually going to remain after yeah. you've kind of beefed up these, these um, foundation walls. So I'd like to know the purpose of doing that. Um, you know, are those foundations compromised in some way that you know, they would ordinarily be demolished? Um, I don't know, but I think that needs to be discussed. Um, and the 20-foot rear yard <coughs> is sort of an, an issue for me. Uh, the majority of the surrounding buildings have non-compliant rear yards, um, but they don't, they have at least 30 feet. So I think they need to talk about um, the impact a little bit more. And I too had the question about reducing to the five foot um, mm -hmm. side yard. Does that, and also does that hamper the, the shared driveway? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, those are my issues. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Item number two, 2115 BC, 112, 35, 69th Avenue. One second. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, okay, this is a 73-621. Um, we are missing the community board recommendation. Um, so my initial review of this was, oh, it's just, it's a 73-621. It's only a 10% increase. That's like a modest type of increase. And so normally when I look at that, I kind of move on. And then I looked at the photograph, I look at the image of the house. And so somehow you're going from an existing two-story U-shaped ranch house without an attic that becomes an effective three-story classic square, including the attic, and only adds 1,000 square feet or 1,100 square feet. And I'm like, I can't figure out how you can do that with only 1,100 square feet. So um, it, in part, it's because the floor plans don't show the actual floor areas um, of all the new portions to be added. It grays in the existing and then just leaves blank the infill. Um, there, uh, there's a huge attic included, which seems to have ample head height. So I'm not sure why they think that isn't floor area, a zoning floor area. And the cellar has two powder rooms and a shower that looks awfully like living space, which makes that floor area. So it looks way more than 10% to me. Um, also, since this is a special permit available only for enlargements, the plans um, need to show what walls and floor area are to be retained. Um, with calculations and making it very clear um, what's existing, what's to be removed, et cetera. Anybody else? Well, they're um, using a bonus for a two-car garage, mm -hmm. but the certificate of occupancy notes that it's a one-car garage. So the starting uh, premise would be an additional 300 square feet, not, I believe, it's 500 square feet. So an additional 10% on top of that is, is limited to the 300 square feet. That's what's legal. Um, so that that's one question. They may have to reduce the size of the house. Um, they're showing a two-car garage on the proposed plans, but I don't see how a second car can maneuver into the, the space. And they need to show the setback lines at the front side and rear yards, because um, these homes are controlled by setback lines instead of perimeter wall height. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Item number three, 3915 BC, 7476 8th Avenue, Manhattan. You have to recuse. I have to recuse, as she said. 
Okay. <sighs> this application is for a variance to permit the construction of a 12-story use group six office building with ground floor retail. That would be contrary to floor area and setback requirements. Uh, the site is located in a C62A zoning district, which permits residential, community facility, and commercial uses as a right, with residential equivalent at C, um, for C62A is R8A. Um, the as of right commercial floor area uh, is six, and the district has a minimum base height of 60 feet, a maximum base height of 85 feet, and an overall building height maximum of 120 feet. The applicant is requesting an FAR of 10.1. Um, the applicant bases the request on the following hardships, the existence of the 8th Avenue subway tunnel, that cuts across and runs under the site affecting 1,310 square feet of the site's 3680 square feet, and that the structural system preferred by the MTA to support the building over the tunnel has um, a $4 million premium cost associated with it, which includes special piles, some framing, tunnel protection, um, including monitoring and warning systems. Um, the board has some questions concerning the financial assumptions that require clarification and substantiation. Sub substantiation. Um, Commissioner Otley Brown, I know, um, wanted to flesh that out a little bit more. Um, but before we get there, additionally, there were questions concerning tenant fit out costs and also some questions concerning the structural system and the proposed and whether the building form is fully appropriate. We have questions concerning using an R8A form. Um, which would allow for perhaps a larger floor plate, even though it's not for residential use, um, but the base height and how that form or something similar to it may affect the cantilever. Uh, Commissioner Montanez may have something to say about that as well, um, as, as did I. Um, also, the applicant should distinguish themselves from the adjacent site, which was the recipient of a grant from the BSA. Um, for similar circumstances. Uh, additionally, concerning the typical plan, which is mentioned but not given to us in plan form, it would be helpful, again, if they showed us a scheme with, an, with R, R8A setbacks. Granted, this is not residential, as I said before, but would be um, beneficial for our um, analysis. Um, so um, why don't we start with Commissioner Montanez and perhaps go to um, uh, Champa for uh, follow-up on building form, and then we'll come to the B finding and talk to Commissioner Otley Brown. Okay, so one thing that I would like to see is um, maybe a redesign of the building regarding the structural format. Um, the applicant or the engineers, the the engineer's letter said that one of the issues about this building is the cantilever is one third to one half of the base. And I was wondering what would happen if that was reduced, um, possibly by lowering the base height of the building or setting back the building in some other way <clears throat> so that um, it would conform to say a, a quarter or a third of the, the, the base area. Um, but I also noted that the proposed construction costs are approximately double what the ideal cost is, and that's not really all the related to the hardship cost. It's related to the actual um, structure of the building and the way that it's designed and the facade cost. So I'm not really sure that this is the minimum variance, and I'm not sure that a redesign of the structural elements of the building would not lead to a lesser variance and lesser costs. Um, <clears throat> one thing uh, related to that is the additional site, which has uh, similar conditions, um, was able to build a building with about a 5.88 FAR. And I would like to see, I'm not sure what the structural conditions, I couldn't find the plans of that adjacent building are mm -hmm in relation to this building. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I guess, 
I was looking at the uh, the girders and I was wondering if it would be possible to remove one of the plate girders um, basically by redesigning the structure of the building and how that would impact on the cost. Okay. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one was I would like to know what is the typical size of a commercial floor plate and the usable floor area of such a floor plate in an as of, uh, for the as of right scenario, a typical project uh, without the subway and the proposed, um, this is for a typical floor on the ground floor and where the setback happens just for a comparison of what is the total floor area uh, that um, for each one of those plates. And going back to the question that uh, uh, Commissioner Hankson uh, raised is that Will a, a, an R8, a residential floor plate for a commercial use, would that lend itself, uh, would that allow for a floor plate that would be uh, feasible for a commercial operation? Uh, so that's where I'm re uh, my, uh, my question leads to. The other question I had, this was more of a zoning question. Um, the as of right mixed use development plan uh, indicates uh, um, uh, the building height. Um, to be 85 feet, whereas the statement of fact mentions 95. So it, something needs to be reconciled. And also, I believe that as of right, mixed use development will be required to have a base of up to 60 to 85 feet and then a setback along 8th and 14th, which the plan does not show. Plan shows a building that's going straight up. Um, at least that's what the plan that we have. Maybe um, we need a much clearer plan on that. Um, that goes to this uh, question of uh, the, the variance that is being sought, which is the setback uh, that is required along 14. It is showing on the drawing that it's 15 feet, whereas I, being 14th Street being a wide street, I, I think it should be 10, 10 and feet. not 15. So it should, would be 10, 10 on both 8th and 14, since both of these are uh, wide streets. Um, so if you can clarify that, that would be helpful. And that may also a reduce the amount of variance that is being requested and goes back to the question of can the building be redesigned in a way um, uh, that would minimize the structural impact on the, on the on the subway tunnel and also result in a lesser variance. Okay. Commissioner Otley Brown, yes, some right. finding. Um, my questions actually have more to do with the E finding probably than than the B finding. Okay. And so I have, let's see, let's start with the first one has to do with the real estate tax and how it was calculated during the construction period and also the rent up period afterwards, as well as <coughs> how it was um, calculated for the income and expense form. It would be helpful if the applicant can walk us through the calculations, starting with what the base tax is right now for the structure with with a one-story building on it, and then how the taxes are expected to increase over time, bearing in mind the fact that real property tax law does freeze your tax bill at the whatever it was prior to construction because there is a three-year construction exemption for any increases in property tax until construction of an office building is deemed complete and it's actually getting rent. So they need to walk us through that because it seems to me that they might be overstating it. I could be wrong, but it looked as if the seven, the current taxes are $72,000 a year. And if they are, then there really is no justification for construction real estate tax and rent of real estate tax to approach a half a million dollars because during the period of construction, that's actually frozen at the current tax bill. So um, then my second question has to do with the income and expense analysis and then also walk us through how you got to <coughs> the $240,000 annual real estate taxes for the as of right and the $500,000 annual real estate taxes for the proposed. As for the retail rents, um, all of the comparables are close inside to the subject. However, they're older and they're probably not in as good condition. Uh, I would like to see some more comparables from newer developments that are in this general area that will actually look in appearance like the retail space that will be on the first floor 
here. There actually was an article in Cranes last week talking about how a developer was going to maximize income on a property simply by renovating their first floor retail space. They were actually going to get 133% of the actual current retail rent just by renovating the space and having a nice large glass facade on the street wall. So I have a feeling that their comparables are understating the amount of income that they could get for the retail space. As for the um, office income information, the vacancy rate is stated at 10%, whereas the Cushman Wayfield report for the fourth quarter 2015 has a Midtown South vacancy rate of 6.2% with the submarket of Chelsea, which ends right at 14th Street at 5.1%, and the Hudson Square West Village at 6.7%. <coughs> and both of those sub-districts actually converge at 14th Street. So I think they need to adjust their vacancy rates downwards um, in reference to that. Um, I also would like them to take another look at the income that they are uh, assuming for this space because the comps are all for smaller spaces and in older buildings with the exception of one comp that's in the new Washington Street building. So I would like to see comparables that are reflecting larger amount of space since this building is going to be, I believe, what, 11 or 12 stories? 12 stories. And actually has large floor plates, all of which are going to be vacant all of which could be leased either separately or as one big large conglomerate of space and that probably would affect the price that you would get for it and so if they can give us some comparables that would show large amounts of space that have been taken it would be helpful in allowing us to figure out what the income would actually be okay. anything further um I, all i only want to say this to state that if they can get the income right on the proposed, we may actually see that this is not the minimum variance and they might be able to take down the amount of floors in the building. Good. Anyone else? No. I, I, just to add to the financing, I just wanted to get a clarification as to the difference between the tenant without cost mm -hmm. uh, in the as of right and the typical development and the proposed. Okay. All right, Commissioner Montanez, anything else? That's it? No, I think um, I, I just need more information about why the proposed construction courts are so high in terms of facade costs and structural steel, if they could give us more detail on that. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I think we need our chair back. Two fifty two fifteen BZ eleven twenty East twenty fourth Street Brooklyn. Um, okay. With respect to the discussion about the first floor extension into the required front yard, um, the Sanborn maps show what was most certainly based on photographs of the existing house a front porch. My question is, and maybe other commissioners know the answer, whether a legal non-complying porch once enclosed continues to be legal non-complying condition because, I don't know, it becomes floor area, maybe the porch was floor area to begin with, I don't know. Depends on the construction of the porch. If the porch was open to the sky, it may not have been floor area. If it, right. if it was already enclosed and it had, you know, balustrades, it was 50%. Um, it may have have been included, but they need to go through that. And that was a question that I had. They need to go through that analysis and tell us exactly what the construction of of that porch was. Right. But even so, even they have illegal construction there now, and I was wondering why can't they give us a complying front yard on the second floor? Right. I think they do. They don't. do. They do. They're do that. saying that they set back to. 15 feet. No, they don't. They don't. They're just taking away yeah. the illegal enclosure of the porch but uh, it's still but they're not counting that the po that it's that still porch a couple of feet was, over yeah. was mm -hmm. legal. It's, there's, it's not a complying front yard on the second floor okay that's true okay 
Okay. And then um, with respect to the side yard reduction that's proposed on one side, I'm still not persuaded that the short portion on <coughs> one side that is only 18 foot 7 feet long out of a total of 61 feet or 30% of the total wall length is sufficient to support the argument that the side yard on that side should be treated as if it's four feet long along that side. Um, furthermore, allowing a reduction to four feet would also reduce the combined total of side, um, side yards to less than the required 12 plus feet. Um, the side yard on that side should be at least five feet, I think, and I don't see why it can't be. I disagree that it would have a substantive impact on the interior layout. Um, in short, um, no changes at all were made to the plans to respond to our comments. The second floor impact on the adjoining properties at the side I find still troubling. Um, something needs to be done to pull the addition on the second floor back or to create porches on the two sides. I think there is a way to accomplish that. Um, that's also true for the massing at the rear that's caused by the very high 14 foot attic, 14 foot high attic. Um, they also should show the areas that count as floor area on the attic plan. I found that kind of strange. The attic didn't seem to have any floor area counted um, or just like a little skinny portion. I'm not really sure what's going on there because you can't really read the plan. It's obscured by the shading. I think uh, it would be easiest if they bring the architect and we could discuss this. It would be more, um, let's say, efficient. Anybody else? I don't understand why on their cellar floor plan they're talking about a new addition at the front of the building where actually they're constructing at the rear and I believe in one of the elevations they show a kitchen in the cellar, one of the sections. Mm -hmm. And I know they're going to turn the, the garage into, I think, a shed, but it wasn't clear to me what the shape of that garage was, because it was, had been illegally enlarged, and it wasn't right. shown well on the plans. And, the, and they were supposed to show three feet between the building yes. and the shed. Right. Yeah. Okay. concludes the public review session for March 21st, 2016. Thank you.